So, um, can you hear me? Okay, all right. I have to, I have to, uh, I am a uh, Pepsi Crate, you know, Pepsi Crate. <laughs> so I can stand on uh, like I did many years ago. Anyhow, um, welcome. This is uh, chapter three in the uh, Gimmich book uh, about the tyrannical text. And the fun so far, I hope we will continue to have fun today as we uh, tackle these texts and, and try to make them uh, uh, at least, uh, if not relevant, explanatory to uh, to our purpose here of uh, honoring uh, our relationship with Scripture. Let's pray. Lord God, we begin with a great, deep sense of gratitude that we can be gathered here today, recognizing the tragedies and the turmoil and the disruptions uh, going on around the globe and so many people who cannot exercise the kind of freedom we experience today please lord god help us not to take this for granted we thank you that uh, once again we can meet together however we recognize that it's not just once again because in this moment a very sacred opportunity to be in fellowship with each other and to be in communion with you is here before us, an opportunity we want to fully exercise and celebrate. And we are, are so thankful for this moment together. Amen. Well, um, last week we reported a uh, now, it's a beautiful that I believe that uh, when, we, uh, when we spoke in this group, and we want to do everything to encourage all the interaction that, is, uh, uh, that you can muster, uh, that in general, when to speak, they just spoke. And when the women spoke, they raised their hands first. And I've honored that ever since as to uh, this, whether or not this was a DNA problem or something else, but it reminds me of the, uh, of the, of the wonderful conversation in one of Woody Allen's movies, uh, it, I think it was Snitch, and he's talking to the heroine, and he says, he says, my little thing's me, you know, she said I was boring. I had the perfect comeback, but when I raised my hand, she wouldn't call on me. And so then I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe uh, not raising your hand, but just blurting out this sort of a male thing. It's sort of like uh, uh, rudeness. Uh, rudeness is a sign of weakness or something like that. But in any case, um, whatever you want to do, and you've got something burning to say, please, please uh, don't hesitate. We will, we will honor and respect, and we can only learn from this lesson by, <clears throat> really, by, um, half of it is by learning from each other. Um, so here we have, let's see what happens. Uh, yes. Um, should... Okay. Uh, there's an arrow here that says go, but it doesn't happen. Okay, anybody out there want to help me? Ah, there it goes. All right. So this is chapter three. And this is, uh, this, this week and next will be the two passages that we uh, can pretty definitely attribute to Paul himself. We cannot write these passages off and say, well, it's Paul wasn't really saying this, it was somebody else. So it has to do with Paul and uh, the good and the bad. Um, and uh, so, um, moving right along, um, 
there are several things just to point out as we begin. Uh, one of the big mistakes that we tend to make nowadays is to take things out of context. Um, and it's called the practice of selective retrieval. That's what the scholars call it. And I'm rem reminded of what uh, A.J. A. Levine uh, said, uh, that text without context is just a pretext to let the Bible say whatever you want it to say. And so context is extremely important in what we do today. And we will talk about the context in which these words might have been spoken. Okay. Uh, we'll make sure we're asking the right question. Um, and we'll come back to that. Uh, the Corinthian letters are really, really unique uh, in their format uh, and their, um, the way they are put together. Um, it's, they cannot be actually separated. Uh, and, uh, and you'll hear that story too. But recognize that this is uh, this is both a practical and fragmentary theology that uh, we are reading today from Paul, and it's uh, it's that he is not writing a, a systematic doctrine uh, like you find in Romans, and so we can't uh, we can't expect it to be that kind of text. He's just trying to solve immediate problems as they are brought to him by delegation from Corinth. Um, and so the other thing that I wanna raise that uh, only came as I studied this, and I've not read this anywhere, so this is sort of original, so you can take it with that kind of credibility. Uh, but the, the point is I'm concerned, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have paid much attention to this uh, had, I, had I not been in my 80s. Uh, and now I'm acutely aware of the um, of the uh, changing the reality of the changing integrity of the human body, and which led me to wonder: uh, Could his health have had something to do with uh, his what seems to be uh, in a moment uh, a lack of uh, a, just an impatience about answering difficult questions? Uh, and finally, there is this, uh, not finally, but uh, another observation here is how Paul in this, uh, in this passage that we're going to read conflates uh, the, the word head as both a, a theological metaphor and an anatomical attachment. And without uh, clarification, he moves from one to the other, and it's part of the reason that this particular passage is confusing. Uh, and so we need to, to make sure we're asking the right question. Should a woman be subordinate to men? Uh, maybe the wrong question. Paul may be instead asking the question, what is the best way to build community? And before we leave this picture, I wanted to ask you if you had a caption that you would add to that as we see Rembrandt's version of Paul um, pondering uh, the dilemma that he's got to write about before he puts these words on paper that we find so puzzling. Yes. Where did I leave my glasses? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Where did I leave my glasses? <laughs> I didn't get that. Oh, right. Hey. <laughs> yes, he could have been saying that. My was so he was just saying women. <laughs> All right. Um, Paul's community though is also ours. Um, his uh, issue was how do you teach and model the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified? versus the words and behaviors of the Christian church as seen through the eyes of the first century secular community. We cannot move ourselves away from the idea that, that uh, Paul was very acutely aware of the church as, a, as having a mission, and the mission was to bring more and more people into the community. And so if the community saw was suspect, saw the the activity, the behavior of the church uh, as being uh, 
radically different from from their sector values and mores, uh, would that uh, would that impair the mission of the church? We have to compare that with what we are dealing with here with a little bit of a twist. But the point is that the the notion that the great chain of being is the way God created the universe with hierarchy uh, and some are greater than others is alive and well and it is the way the world works and yet we have this christian theology about the place of women and we've seen it evolve but it really is evolving in the secular side it does not seem that the church is leading this movement but is accommodating it and and what could be happening if indeed the church was following paul's understanding of what it means to be in christ so we have that to struggle with let's talk a little bit about the corinthian letter uh, let's see if my arrow worked good. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> and this has to do with the, do with the discussion of, of Paul's health, but also to give you the contextual background of how these letters were written. And nobody knows the dates. And a lot of this is speculative uh, because it may be a, a phrase here or a word there that we're making, drawing some conclusions about. But anyhow, so here was the second mission. I uh, went through Athens, ended up in Corinth, and Corinth, where he stayed for, the Bible says, uh, Acts says, a year and a half. From there, he sails over to Ephesus, uh, and he, um, he uh, is followed by, um, he goes with Priscilla and Aquila, and they are later joined by Apollos. Uh, and at this point, he writes his first letter, which we call the lost letter. Uh, and it's referred to in 1 Corinthians 5.9. Uh, uh, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral persons. It's also believed, speculated, that part of this letter is embedded in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 17 point, up to 7, 6, 14 to 7, 1. And this is the two letters really cannot be totally separated. Uh, that's the dilemma. We think of uh, actually four letters, at least four letters being written. And that's what we're talking about here. So um, in this uh, lost letter, uh, which we think is in uh, this little passage in 2 Corinthians, he's advising against associated with uh, pagans and other unbelievers. Then uh, the, the Corinthian church uh, replies in a letter brought by Stephanus Fortunatus, Fortunatus and Achaicus, who ask a series of questions that we can only infer from his response. At about the same time, uh, the, the, the presence of the three men are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 16, 17. And uh, at the same time, close people in 1 Corinthians 1, 11, they bring news of factions in the church. And Paul then responds with 1 Corinthians, which is his pastoral letter. And he responds to all the different factions. And that's what we're struggling with today. Uh, a mostly eloquent illustration this is of the trials of a young Christian church in a pagan world. The two passages that so disturb us are in this pastoral letter, but let's continue the travelogue uh, so we can sort of understand the question about his health. Timothy at that point is sent to Corinth where he is rebuked. The situation is reported to be getting out of hand. Paul then writes his third letter, uh, which we call the stern letter. Uh, and part of this is believed to be 2 Corinthians 10 to 13. He sends it back by Titus, and Titus had Titus goes by land, so Titus goes this way, goes 
this way. Well, while he's gone, we don't know how long this takes, obviously months, Paul becomes concerned. He's concerned that Titus might be treated badly as well. So he decides to meet him, we think. Uh, and so he sets out, and when he gets to Macedonia, he bumps into Titus, who is returning uh, from Corinth. And Titus brings uh, good news. Um, and um, and that the Corinthians are doing better. He then writes 2 Corinthians 1 through 9, his thankful letter, a letter of warm affection and thankfulness. And in it, he speaks a lot about his personal suffering. He intimates that he's been sick and feared he was dying. He appears to be speaking both literally and metaphorically. And this passage uh, is... Uh, is about that. It's 2 Corinthians 1, 8 to 1. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. And remember, he's uh, already been beaten up two or three times uh, by different uh, uh, groups of people as he was traveling through. Uh, for we were so utterly unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death so that we would rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. For I wrote you out of much distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Sounds to me almost like an apology uh, for uh, what he had said before. Uh, Second Corinthians is felt to be his uh, most important state statement about the suffering which he considered uh, a central part of following Jesus. So uh, now let's see, I think we have the passage. And I apologize, it's a long passage. Hopefully we'll be able to, you'll be able to gather it. Uh, I don't have it on another piece of paper for you, but uh, we'll continue to look at this as you think about it. Uh, I continue, I, I commend you because you rem remember me in everything and maintain the traditions just as I handed them on to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. And remember, this is recognized as one of the most tortured, contradictory, and confusing sections in all of Paul's letters. That's Charles, a quote from Charles Campbell, uh, who's written a long book on 1 Corinthians. Um, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and man is the head of woman, and God is the head of Christ. Any man who prays or prophesies with something on his head disguises his head. It disgraces his head. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered disgraces her head. It is one of the same thing as having her head shaved. Now, you only shave the woman's head when they were caught in adultery, right before you stoned them. For if a woman wants to cover her head, then she should cut off her hair. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or to be shaved, she should cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. Indeed, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Now we've got Genesis 1 in there, so he's using his theological uh, uh, rationing, uh, uh, rationalization. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. For this reason, a woman ought to have authority over her head because of the angels. Nobody knows what in the world Paul was talking about when he said because of the angels. Maybe, you know, there were good angels and bad angels and and if women came under the influence of bad angels, they might uh, do something immoral or something. Yeah, but nobody knows. Um, major, major word. He's now reversing his argument. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man or man independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through a woman. But all things come from God. But I'm glad he got that part of the... the you know, medical knowledge, right? Judge for ourselves. Is it proper for a man to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you? For nature, think of 
the secular uh, values, secular values, mores, um, secular wisdom, secular knowledge, second, secular practices. That's what he means by nature. Um, does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is degrading to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone is disposed, if anyone disagrees, to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God, at least the ones that Paul had been involved with uh, in Asia. Okay. What do we do with this? Yes. Yes. What? I'm sorry. Charlie, isn't it true that in the Old Testament we see um, men who who made a vow to God that they would not cut their hair um, because it showed their dedication to the Lord or whatever? So. Um, I have to believe that that Paul is addressing, as you said, the current customs of the day, because I do think that we have um, Old Testament evidence of men who did have long hair and it was not degrading to them. Yes. So obviously, whatever he's blubbering about, he's not addressing all times. And custom. Right. And and that's really good. And there, and even in Paul's time, in fact, Paul does this uh, to accommodate uh, a, a faction uh, of the Jews. He he has his own hair cut. Uh, but I think this is this may be somewhat different because women don't apply to that particular rule, um, old old testament or new. And so now we're talking about cutting women's head, and that is has to has to do with, of course, the the disgrace. And I think that's one of Paul's issues here. Yes. I think the very point, you know, and really because what you were pointing out is that what was done in that era, we cease to do in our own. In other words. What Paul was writing in the first century was not applicable in 7th century BC. It was offered as a model, not as, oh, biggest lie in the world is about to happen. Easy to assemble. In other words, you follow the instructions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and if you don't, you won't put the box in the other. Okay. I don't think that's what's being offered in the scripture often, that is, with respect to Ten Commandments, to be sure, right? But often what's offered is a model. If it works this way, use it. If it doesn't, tweak it in such a way that it works well for your community. Okay. Okay, so, so do I hear you saying that Paul is actually arguing that in this particular situation, following the values of the secular community may work better for the church than following the words that I have previously put out about freedom in Christ? Yeah. 
Well, he's writing a letter, not to Ephesus. He's writing a letter to the people in Corinth. That's your point. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Um, So you're speaking of uh, Paul using the the uh, Greek philosophical ar argument, uh, the the Socratic kind of method in which he's presenting both sides of of an argument. That's what you're. Yeah, it's like saying saying as if saying we understand. This, this way, and yet, nevertheless, there's a different way to look at it. Yeah. Um, he's not doing that. And of course, that course has not been taken that way by contemporary culture who would prefer to just take the passage uh, that women are not, they, they would interpret this to say women are not meant to speak and pray and prophesy. Uh, the the implicate the the assumption is not that women in this passage should keep silence. It's assumed that they are going to be speaking, and the real question is, what should their dress code be? Um, so, but you know, so we we to be charitable. Obviously, we're dealing with uh, a radical idea of what it means to be in Christ. And we're dealing with a secular culture, which is having difficulty even beginning to understand that, that the leader of this movement was crucified. I mean, that doesn't make a bit of sense. And so, yes. Back earlier in that, in that uh, chapter, Some of this may have been distinguishing the church from those uh, competing religions. Yeah, and I think we can make that's another facet here that's going on. We can make a lot of different things out of this. Uh, so I, I go on with that. Uh, and so here we have. Um, using the head as a metaphorical statement. We talked about this at length last week. Um, so man is the head of woman is a metaphorical idea of, of uh, leadership superiority. Um, is it? Yes. Well, you're absolutely right, and we're going to come back to that, uh, too. Uh, so, um, so we have the the theological argument um, that he uses Genesis one, um, and now um, what to do with that? Of course, um, he if we're going to argue.
All right. If we're going to argue uh, theology, we have a problem here because he doesn't, um, he ignores the rest of first chapter in which he says uh, uh, that well, we're all created in the image of God, male and female created he them. Uh, and so uh, there we go with Paul contradicting good solid scripture, or at least selectively uh, taking out the passage that he's wants to, to support his argument. Uh, and now we have the um, the issue of the anatomical head. Uh, so, uh, and this has to do with the shame issue. Uh, and the shame issue is uh, a big part of why we need to, I think, understand the dilemma that Paul found himself in. Um, so, the, the notion um, of shame is huge in the first century, much more than it is now in Western culture. Interestingly, if you go to the Asian culture, shame is an honor, still huge issues written into their, their code of laws if you uh, if you shame someone in public, you can go to jail for it. Uh, so, you know, it's a little bit different, but in the first century, um, shame, um, persons of all ethnicities in the Mediterranean world, for them, honor was the greatest social value to be preferred over wealth and even life itself. Without a good reputation, life had no meaning. Honor was thus a powerful incentive and shame a powerful disincentive. And Paul employs both to full advantage as his argument unfolds. So he leaves the theological argument behind. And now he's really, when he's talking about um, woman praying with her head uncovered, uh, it is disgraceful uh, for a woman to uncover her head. Uh, so here we have that it appears that the question, the argument here is not about hierarchy, about male over female. Uh, it's about a social custom that protects the all important principles of honor and shame. So that would give us a little bit of a, a reason as to, um, uh, as to why we should show a little bit of, uh, of sympathy to Paul's predicament. We also have to point out that Paul created this for himself because he's the one talking about freedom in Christ. Uh, so uh, to foster a climate which allowed shaming could severely damage the church's standing in the community was one of his problems. So um, some of you have uh, the handout, which uh, and I need to point out that um, these actually come from, uh, Ginch borrowed these from the Presbyterian Understanding and Use of Holy Scriptures, 1983, uh, that has uh, these passages on it. And so um, it argues about, uh, and these are the ones that Andy put on the back of his sheet, but he, but as you can see, there are nine of these, and she borrowed four of them. Uh, so if you were going to argue against Paul for this passage, um, would you, um, what would you have to say about uh, Scripture versus Scripture? We talked about Genesis. Um, any other passage come to mind? It's like cherry picking, and we'll we'll recognize this, and we'll throw this out. 
Right. And I have the same problem when you talk about Genesis because in Genesis, I can always say, God made man. Well, he found out he could do better than we made woman. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's biblical on a picture. It's perfect. Your verse? Yes. And Paul's sitting here just throwing that to the wind. Right. And then you've got language barriers and how it was written and who's translated it. And right. I think mm -hmm. the literacy that we get into when we look at the Bible can be so damning, for lack of a better word, that we close off, we pick and choose what we use, and then we throw it out there to make everything the way we want it. And it's exclusive instead of inclusive. And so that's what I see happening here. I, you know, I take his letter and look at it and say, what was his mindset? What had he been through? What was he looking at? Who were the people he was trying to please? Almost like politicians. Who are they talking to and what do they want? Let me give them that. And so that's kind of where I get with all this. As you can see, it's very frustrating to me. Um, because I think the very thing is going to turn around and look at it and say, and I think at the time Paul wrote this, I think he was in that same mindset. Beautifully said. And and that's, you know, one of the chief reasons we are here. Uh, having this discussion today because uh, of the the uh, huge risk that at any point we can abuse uh, the scripture. We do need to start with one statement of agreement that the Bible is our canon. It is what we go by and live by. That's it. But that does not mean that everything that is in the Bible is authoritative. And so that's what we're trying to learn. How do we tell the difference between something that is authoritative and something that is not? Uh, and so these are the four things that she would use. Uh, and she would, and so we really need to spend a little bit of time talking about them. Uh, and, and scripture compatible with scripture is just, as you said, the passage he chose in Genesis 1 is contradictory to another verse right in the same chapter. Uh, that's contradictory. Uh, it's also contradictory with the idea of hierarchy because we have uh, Galatians 3 that says that we're all the same. So when we show, then we would, you know, when we see a series of passages that contradict. Um, another passage we, that helps us evaluate uh, just which are the more authoritative of the passages. Anybody want to argue debate that? Yes. There's that sentence that says, the right? Uh, and um, I guess So you're, you're arguing that that Paul is really saying both sides of, the, of his argument. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a real, it's a real concern for us uh, as to whether or not he's doing that. And also, yeah, it's like you say with the question mark. Uh, and next week we'll have this question, which you want to put in there. What? You, you know, question mark as though he's reversing himself. Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, it seems like it would kind of like sink into the politics and the way you wrote this. And it seems to me that it's like uh, these traditions are uh, are uh, created for all good reasons. But when it comes down to it, you know, they work to get that through, but if they don't, they create conflict. And you know, you're throwing out the you know, guardrails and saying, you know, church has really saying good about this. Um, so, you know, it's like, you know, they work as great. So creating sort of you know sort of all the uh, you know they don't work in great conflict you know they should be taken care of you know. right oh dear all right yes so am I okay um is there anything that I need to we we have run um oh okay this is back to we talked uh, about dress codes. And throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And the, the, the issue I think that you're bringing up again, Paul is sitting like a politician. Jesus was anything but a politician. We'd all agree with that, right? I mean, he didn't say things that would make life uh, more accommodating for us. All right. Um, and so we do have, there's another argument that. Maybe Paul is really pushing the edge of the envelope here because he really thinks Jesus is coming back and he wants to do something urgently. And that may be why he's being forceful. That's just another uh, argument. Uh, yeah, and so we still have the headdress issue um, in parts of the world. Uh, I mean, people are being executed for it, um, which uh, makes you... Um, really wonder um, how far we've come with this argument. It makes these, these discussions extremely relevant. Um, so uh, should Paul be condemned for this or abandoned or forgiven? Um, Is Paul arrogant? I just think this is not his finest moment. Yeah, okay. I mean, he could have been, you know, he could have been sick. He was, and he, there's one thing that I know about being sick is it makes you very impatient. And you, you get this sense. Right. And say, because change is hard. Yeah. And creating something new in a space that is um, uh, sometimes reluctant to embrace the new relational model that Jesus followed, it, it, you have to create some, a little some structure in order for that change to be palatable to people. So, I, you know, in a way, I think that's a, uh, a really trying to find a power, but maybe the problem we've got to be sharing and the problem we've got to do the lens of that relational forgiving love that Jesus teaches us. Right. And maybe what he's trying to do is just say, okay, let's just, everybody calm down and let's just have, let's, let's have a little structure here and a little order, and then we're going to build on that. Because, you know, he had a pretty tough job. Uh, to leave the of the early Absolutely, I can't agree more. And, and the and the, um, the the yeah the 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 principles really are um, are complex and difficult. I'm afraid we we've, we've got to go. Um, uh, I I do sort of feel a need to sort of summarize this to a certain extent 
the good news is uh, we're going with this discussion because next week's passage is even worse. Uh, and so uh, we'll be right back continuing the discussion. And something about what we've dealt with here is um, I, I get the feeling from Rembrandt's picture, especially, that uh, Paul and the women of the church are both in a double bind. And part of it is to his creation because he's given them the freedom that if they don't want to wear, they don't have to. Uh, and at the same time, he wants uh, to argue on the side of the church. Yes, you should wear uh, covering if you're going to, when you, when you stand to preach or to prophesy uh, or to pray. So that's what he's saying. Uh, and there is a sense that for all of us, when we are uh, modeling, attempting to model with our lives the life that Jesus would want us to, to show, that we really are in sort of two different worlds and we cannot divorce ourselves from either one. Uh, we are in Christ on one hand, we are living our lives as though the kingdom is here and has arrived and we're going to behave that way. And at the same time, there is this uh, secular reality that we have to deal with and to some extent accommodate to. And this is what makes life so hard and our discussions uh, so relevant and fascinating. Family, I'm a big players in Paul's uh, decision to opt for the order as opposed to the freedom. Uh, and we have to wonder if this is not, to some extent, Paul, not necessarily just showing two sides, a paradox of an either or, but he's actually talking about this third state. Uh, we call it a tertium quid, which basically is uh, a third way of considering something uh, in which instead of either or, it's both and. And that's sort of a state that is very difficult to achieve. So anyhow, um, yeah, so sorry, we have to sort of abruptly close, but I have to go sing. That's right. Lord God, you, you hear our our affirmations and our cries of protest and our puzzling over difficult passages. And we ask in this moment that you lead us to a state of total humility in which we really don't know and we don't understand. And so what we, what we do now is trust in you. That the decisions that we make as we go forth from this place are in accord with your wishes for the nature of the beautiful thing that you have created for us. Amen. Thank you all. See you next week. I'm going to go to the next one.